All right. Thank you for coming, everyone, this evening. Um, I'm Lucy Birmingham, the president of the FCCJ. We are very, very excited to be launching tonight our first Meet the Press seminar series with Tokyo Bureau Chiefs and Foreign Correspondents. Tonight we are very, very privileged to have William Billy Mallard, a Deputy Bureau Chief for Thomson Reuters. Please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> uh, Billy has been a financial reporter, editor, and manager for more than 25 years. He got his start in Kentucky and Atlanta. Throughout the 1990s, he was a reporter and editor in Tokyo and joined Reuters in 1998. Then he jumped ship uh, in 2000 to become Japan bureau chief for Dow Jones Newswires. In 2003, he moved to Singapore for about 10 years where he continued working for Dow Jones and then the Wall Street Journal when the two merged. In 2013, he returned to Tokyo for his present position as Deputy Bureau Chief for Reuters. So, we have a truly veteran foreign correspondent here, steeped in business knowledge and some opinions, yes? Some opinions. So, you'll be able to ask him lots of questions. Um, for, this, for our time schedule this evening, what we're going to do, um, Billy will speak probably, what, tw about 20 minutes, something like that? 10, 5. 10, 5. Two. Two. <laughs> um, we'll then have a question and answer session until about eight, and then that will be followed by a networking session until nine. So you'll be able to network among yourselves and ask him lots of questions. Um, we'll have some snacks and some drinks over there that you can enjoy during that hour until nine o'clock. So, you're on. Would you like to begin? Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Is this on? Can, can everybody hear me? Okay. Get a little closer. Uh. Mm, all right. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, hello, uh, I'm Billy Mallard, as Lucy said. Um, I've been in this room many times, but I've always sat where you're sitting. Uh, I've never come up here, so it feels very strange, <laughs> uh, because usually I expect that the person sitting here has something to impart, and I'm not sure that I do. Um, uh, I hope you didn't come expecting a big speech. Uh, because I don't really have one, um, but uh, I do see some familiar faces, but I also see a lot of faces I don't recognize, and so I'm hoping that you'll have questions that I can help you with, um, uh, and rather than guessing what you might be interested, I hope you will um, assertively, if not aggressively, ask questions about whatever you want to know. Um, I believe, um, this is strange sitting here with the, <laughs> the light, it's really bright. Um, could, could, I'm curious how many of you are working journalists in the room? Okay, oh, hey, Daniel, how are you? Uh, and how many are not? Oh. <laughs> and I'm not going to ask if there's anyone in between. Okay, so um, that helps me. If there was a lot of journalists, I would really feel like I had nothing to say. Um, so I intend to just talk f for a couple of minutes about Reuters. Um, I guess everyone knows that there are lots of news organizations in Tokyo. Um, we're one of them. <laughs> we're a peculiar, we occupy a space on the continuum of size and uh, the things that we write about. Um, and others are very different, as you can guess. Um, and so I have been hanging around for a good long while, and I'm trying to pay attention. But uh, I hope I can I hope I can answer questions that you have about journalism in particularly in particular. Um, so everybody's heard of Reuters. Good nodding heads. Good. I won't put you on the spot. Um, the company is about 160 years old, I think. Uh, it was named, uh, it's named after a guy named Paul Julius Reuter, who was a German who became a British citizen. Uh, <clears throat> and he famously um, sent news and messages by carrier pigeon uh, early on and 
Uh, in one case, he was sending messages between Brussels and Aachen, and I'm quoting Wikipedia here, I'm sorry to say. Uh, this was the missing link between Berlin and Paris. So messages, news, information that was of value and interest to the stock markets, the stock exchanges around Europe, could then pass uh, much faster between Paris and Berlin than previously, and that gave uh, Mr. Baron Reuters customers uh, uh, an advantage. <clears throat> and for us, that's, um, we do all kinds of news. Um, I, you've seen our stories in the newspapers and our photos in the news and our videos on your TV screens. But the core of what we do uh, goes back to the pigeon days. We, um, the, the, our, our core clients, our core customers are financial institutions and the, the base around which our business is built is financial news for the financial markets and we've spread out from there. Um, and, uh, excuse me, Baron Reuters was also interested in the technology of his day, so he made a lot of use of the telegraph, which was a new thing then. Um, so, you know, in the same way we try to keep up with technology today, uh, if you've looked at our Reuters.com website, you might not believe that, but uh, we try to, we try to use technology to, to, to um, get our news as fast uh, and as, as, as fast as possible to our, to our customers. Um, so now we are, we have about 2,600 journalists of various stripes uh, around the world in about 200 locations um, from big bureaus like Tokyo to Stringers, I think that, I'm not sure actually if that includes Stringers or all full-time staff people, um, but we have certainly one-person bureaus, uh, but we've got people dispersed around the world. Um, uh, according to us, uh, our news is seen by uh, one billion people a day. I have no idea how we came up with that number, but because um, that's a lot of people, but that's what we say, so I'm saying it. Um, <laughs> sorry if, <I've laughs> if I sound a little irreverent. Um, I said I'm, I'm not used to being on this side of the table. Um, and among, the, uh, among our customers are 1,000 newspapers, uh, 750 broadcast outlets, uh, 400,000 of our core subscribers. Uh, think of banks and brokerages that have maybe screens in their trading rooms that are flickering with um, prices and data and also with our news stories. Um, those are our core clients because they'll pay a lot of money for um, fast and accurate news for the markets. Um, our other, we have three main customers. So when when you think about what we do, or when we think about what we do, we have um, uh, three basic customer bases with overlapping interests. So the financial markets, who pay us subscription fees to get our news and data. And then we have other media companies, that's the sort of wholesale role that we have, and that is TV stations, NHK, CNN, BBC, who buy our video, uh, and then uh, whether they buy it, just the, the background video or packages or however they want to use it, put it on their site. Um, uh, they buy our pictures, um, TV, I'm sorry, newspapers and other magazines, uh, media will, will pay for um, our news and then they can put it display it however they want. That's a second segment that's also um, fee-based. And then the third segment uh, is, uh, is the public internet that's direct from us to customers. So we, we deal with financial industry, 
other media customers and then directly to the general public. Um, Reuters.com, as I mentioned, is our main global platform, but we have, um, we publish in 20 languages. I can't remember how many we've got on websites, but we have a Japanese website that is uh, the number two in terms of business and financial news. It's behind the Nikkei, uh, no surprise, but I believe it's ahead of Yahoo Finance and everybody else. So it's quite popular, uh, and uh, Reuters.com is in English and other languages. And those are all free to anybody with the internet. Um, and it's a, a funny little thing about our business that um, financial clients will pay a lot of money for, uh, for news that is very fresh, particularly even a, a headline that they can trade on uh, if it's market moving and exclusive. Um, but very quickly that news is no longer so valuable and it becomes a commodity and pretty soon everybody else has got the same basic information and has tweeted it or put it on their websites. And so something that, that we sent you know, initially to paying customers for, a few minutes later maybe we're happy to put it on the, the internet for free. Um, that's the crazy changing nature of, of technology and of information, particularly for the financial markets. So you can see a, a pretty, pretty big selection of our news pictures and video on these websites. Um, so click away. Uh, and those are, of course, paid for by advertisers who put annoying little things on there for you to, to, uh, to see. Um, uh, we, s we put out 2.5 million stories a year in 20 languages. Um, so that's, that's a lot of data and information. Um, uh, that's sort of who we are. Um, oh, I forgot to mention our, our famous, our biggest early scoop, and that was almost, ex it was 150 years ago this month. Um, Reuters was the first in Europe with the news of the Lincoln assassination. Uh, and I don't remember the details, but I think it was one of those crazy stories of sending a boat out to meet the mail ship before it docked and getting the news uh, uh, a little bit ahead of the, the other guys. But that, of course, in those days, that was a little bit faster uh, in getting the, you know, a big story to Europe. Um, and so that's, that's who we are and what we do. In, in Tokyo, we have uh, about 100 journalists. Um, and that's pretty big. I'm, um, I don't ever say the name Bloomberg because they're competitors, but they also have a big bureau. And I'm guessing that those are probably the two biggest foreign operations in terms of numbers of journalists. Um, uh, and, that, and size doesn't equal, doesn't necessarily correlate with, uh, with quality. Um, we, think we're, we think we're good, um, but you know, the, the New York Times has two full-time reporters and some news assistants, I believe, um, and they think they're pretty good. So we serve different, um, different needs and, and we, we work a little bit differently, and I'll be happy to talk about that if you're interested. Um, we have 100-ish people in Tokyo, uh, journalists, and uh, they are divided um, fairly evenly between English language and Japanese language journalists, since we, we put out uh, our news in both languages from here. Um, in most cases, in our different teams of uh, reporters, we are um, we're largely integrated. That is to say, we'll have we have a group of people who cover companies, and some of them write in English and some of them write in Japanese. Um, but we try to, uh, our goal is to think of ourselves as one team covering 
Japan uh, in two languages. Uh, it's uh, it's not always a perfect match, but but that's you know, we think it's important to be one team in two languages as opposed to two parallel teams. Um, we are also our our group consists of uh, reporters, editors, particularly. Uh, we have a fair number of Japanese language editors because that product is mostly um, created, edited, and published here. Um, also, a team of translators uh, who translate Reuters news from around the world into Japanese for a Japanese audience. Um, and so the, and that includes our TV folks and our still photographers. We also have a group of very specialized journalists um, in a group called Deal Watch, which used to be a separate company that's now part of our team. And they cover the debt and capital markets, uh, sorry, the, the, the debt and equity capital markets. That is to say, very specialized information on um, companies raising money in, by selling stocks or uh, selling bonds. Um, and that's, that's who our group is. So it's broken down into different units, people who cover companies, who cover the financial industry, who cover the economy uh, and economic policy. So 100-ish, which sounds like a fairly big number in, at first, breaks down into fairly small groups. So I always feel like we're outnumbered and, and uh, struggling to keep up even when, we, even when we seem to have a big number of people. Um, that's who we are in Tokyo. Um, and how many of you are work with companies that come into contact with the news media or want to come into contact with the news media? OK, some of you. Um, uh, I would just say that uh, I don't know what people think the news, the journalist's relationship with companies and with the government is supposed to be, or what we think it is. But from my point of view, we're not uh, enemies of companies or the government. We're not always friends with companies or government. Uh, but we very much want to have good relationships with, um, with uh, all the companies that we cover um, and with the government because you know Japan is back. Uh, with all that that entails. Uh, the eyes of the world are on Abenomics, uh, and, and you know everyone in the world wants to know how this is going to play out, whether it's going to be the, the start of something new or you know another spectacular failure. And we're keenly interested in that too. Um, and so you know if, you, if you're interested, we can talk more about this. Um, we're going to, sometimes we're going to write things that uh, a given company might not like. At the same time, sometimes a company or a government has a good news story. They've got, they've got good news to tell about, uh, about what they're doing. And we try very hard to be, um, uh, to be independent and to report fairly and accurately on what, uh, what people and companies and governments are doing. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't know who made this phrase up, but um, if, if there are any, any PR folks in the room? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, we don't bite. Um, you know, the, 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 I don't know where the phrase came from, but somebody said, um, tell your story or somebody else is going to tell it for you. Mm -hmm. So we, we pride ourselves as journalists on not being spun by other people, by um, not just taking the, the line the way it's given and, and, and purveying it on. But, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a dirty little secret. We rely on the people who make news, um, and so we do want to talk to you. I guess the, rather, as, rather than seeing it uh, in terms of friends or adversaries, it really is true that we want to understand you. We really want to understand what you do. So uh, if you're dealing with the press, uh, help us to understand you because 
you know, if you don't tell the story, somebody else is going to. So that, um, that really is all I have prepared to say, and I hope you're keenly uh, uh, ready to attack with questions. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, so let's open the floor up to questions. Anybody have a question? Dan Sloan has a question, I'm sure. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. All right, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, please. Um, how, what are we going to do about the mic? Yeah, sorry, you're going to have to. Oh. Do we have a hand mic that we can give him? I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you mine. Sure. This is not a plant, I swear. Disclaimer uh, <laughs> that I know this man and I used to work for his company. Um, Bill, if you look out, you, you were in another country uh, not so long ago, and you came back, and you have an environment that is perhaps less restrictive mm. uh, for media than the one you were in before. But it also has a government that in some ways, maybe not so tangibly, but uh, noticeably seems to be trying to influence media now. Mm. With the, you know, the brief that Reuters has to have you know, the news without bias, mm. and you know, as you were very uh, adeptly saying, telling the story as, as honorably and fairly as you can, what are the challenges that a news agency has when there seems to be a political wind blowing about what the media does? Hmm. Thank you. Um, my disclaimer is that uh, I'm not allowed really to express my own opinions. Uh, that's part of the whole Reuters thing, um, which as Dan can tell you, makes my Facebook posts very interesting and I, uh, very boring and I only write about cats. Um, well, that's, that's, that's a great subject. Um, uh, I was in Singapore for 10 years. That is the country Dan was referring to and they do have a bit more restrictive uh, press policies. The Japanese media environment is uh, much more rambunctious and free and fair by comparison. Um, Having said that, uh, the company I was working for in Singapore, Dow Jones, was sued by the government. The company I'm working for now and my boss uh, are being sued here by a company um, for, uh, they claim that we libeled them. We say we did not. Um, uh, not by the government though, I should say. So yeah, the, um, there's, there's been a lot of attention to um, the, the media, the relationship between government and the media here. Um, I think you had, you had Mr. Koga here just recently, Shigeaki Koga. Um, is everybody familiar with his story? Okay, most people are. So uh, former METI. <coughs> guy, elite bureaucrat, um, was on TV Asahi, very prominent program, uh, and on his final broadcast he said uh, things against the Abe administration and uh, uh, said that he had been bashed heavily by uh, the administration, naming specifically Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga, um, and this caused a gigantic stir and a furor. Um, and uh, so a couple of observations about that. Um, the first is, well, we had, we had written a story a month or two before talking about this, this issue of um, uh, certainly not, I don't think anyone's alleging direct censorship, but there are people who say that there's uh, government pressure to cover them a certain way or not cover them a certain way. Um, Self-censorship is probably the most relevant thing. 
Um, we reported at the time that um, uh, we actually quoted Kogasan at the time making uh, some of the same accusations that he later made on TV. Um, uh, sadly, uh, no one paid much attention to our story. Um, uh, and uh, that a, um, a producer at one of the big TV stations um, was let go from, from the position she had, the prominent position, um, after uh, running stories that, that the government didn't like. Um, so I do think there is that climate. Uh, there's certainly that, um, there's that impression. The government, of course, will deny that they do any such thing. But it was striking when Prime Minister Abe um, uh, was on a live interview and he criticized the choice of the, the uh, man on the street interviews that they showed. And he said, you know, these are slanted. You've, you've chosen these to make me look bad. Um, you know, in, 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 on the one hand, that's simply Mr. Abe's got free speech rights like everybody else. And he can say, I don't like that. Um, on the other hand, one could say, and many people did, um, well, that's the prime minister putting pressure on a broadcaster, and this, this uh, raises freedom of speech concerns. Um, I, was, I guess I've been personally surprised by the extent to which um, on TV shows or other um, any other occasion, there's a lot of uh, preparation, uh, uh, going through in advance what you're going to publish or say uh, on the program. I don't don't have or couldn't express an opinion on whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. But that is a um, that is a a practice that has come to light that maybe not everybody knew. That when you see a commentator giving his or her opinion on a program. They've probably gone in great detail beforehand, you know, in the green room on what they're going to say. Um, um, I guess I was surprised at the amount of shock and horror um, that Kogasan said what he said, expressed his opinion about the government. Um, it's been quite interesting that uh, that both um, TV Asahi, the broadcaster in that. Uh, case and NHK have both been hauled in in recent days before a panel of the LDP um, to be asked about uh, in the TV Asahi case that incident and in the uh, in the case of NHK some uh, Yarase some um, uh, apparently allegedly fabricated um, coverage um, that seems surprising to me when when a, a government type body would call someone in to, to grill them on that. Um, and if I understand it correctly, the, the problem that, that the authorities have with TV Asahi was um, that, that, and I believe Mr. Suga said that they allowed, it was one-sided, it was ipoteki, they, they had unchallenged criticism of the government um, from Mr. Koga. They didn't, they didn't, uh, you know, the, the, the announcer challenged him on, on the facts he was making, but, but there w it, it, was, it was just an anti-Abe view for those three minutes. Um, you know, if, if again, uh, th that's, that's not for me to, uh, to say whether that's good or bad, that's how it's done. But, you know, if, if the Abe administration thinks that that's, um, that that's outrageous to, to have uh, uh, one-sided negative coverage, uh, commentary about them on the airwaves, I would ask them to go to the United States and watch some of the cable news programs there because uh, um, the, government of, uh, the government gets a lot of unchallenged negative publicity. You know, if I had to express an opinion, I'm for open debate and discussion and I you know, don't like restrictions on it. Um, but, you know, Dan, as you, as you said, that's very different from Singapore. You wouldn't see that kind of, you know, I guess it's, a, I guess it's all a, a continuum. Um, 
you know, the, uh, you wouldn't see anything approaching criti direct criticism of the government in Singapore. You can find it here. Sometimes it's indirect. Um, you know, I sometimes like to read editorials in the Japanese papers, and uh, I don't know why I like to read them because they really never express a strong opinion, but uh, they're very gentle and they make kind of suggestions at the very end. You know, that's, that's, I don't know how much that is cultural, I don't know how much of that is not wanting to upset advertisers and the people in power. Um, but it's a, it's just a different, it's just a different way of doing things. But by the same token, um, uh, compare U.S. and American newspapers. Um, as you know, we the American newspapers tend to see them their role as providing fair, you know, some aim at unbiased news on the news pages, and then have as much colorful opinion and and debate as they want on the editorial pages. British newspapers, the stories themselves uh, might be, have much more of a slant to them. Um, that's just how people choose to do it. And at Reuters, we, we, you know, we try not to show any bias. Um, so I don't think I answered your question, but that's just sort of <laughs> observations after 10 years away. OK. Anybody else? Question? Yes. Yes, somebody? <laughs> I'm sure you've got some. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. Good evening. My name is Nazafar, and I work at NHK World Persian Radio. I have, <laughs> I have a question about, um, OK, we all know that Reuters news are just, uh, they scoop big news, you know. Um, we try to. Yeah, <laughs> and especially in Iran, actually. You know. ah. So um, I would like to know that. Um, uh, through journalism, is it right to, for example, when we guess about, okay, something is going wrong, but we don't have any documents to approve, but uh, we um, make a report and uh, just put it in, you know, among our reports, but we don't have, for example, any proof. Mm. So is it all right? For example, I, I remember about three years ago, I think, 2012, uh, Reuters um, journalists in Iran, in Iran they uh, made a report about uh, ninja women. Ah, yes. So, and then after that, they said, "Oops, we made a mistake." So they they are not uh, trained to kill people, but the first they said something like that. After you know, then uh, government showed reaction, and you know, uh, bears the. Uh, press cards and all the, these yeah. things and they say that but I, I was thinking that for example um, in that case I was thinking okay they they guess there's something wrong and then they didn't have any proof they just want to get uh, you know attention of the world to uh, and then after that they had to say that okay we're sorry to you know mm -hmm. to continue working so um, I'm uh, my question is uh, how much is it's uh, correct to do such a thing through you mm -hmm. know in journalism mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. On the specific question, um, I have to be very careful, mostly, partly because I'm talking about my own company and I'm not at liberty to do so, but mostly because I'm not uh, directly aware of the facts. That happened before I rejoined Reuters and I've just been told about the case, so I, uh, I, I can't say anything specific because I simply don't know, but I, uh, I will go out on a limb because I believe I was told that um, the, the, the part that was in question and in dispute that became an issue was actually a caption on a photograph as opposed to something that was in a story. So that, um, uh, that's all I know about the, the specific case. Your broader question about when when is it okay to report something you haven't substantiated? Um, that's a huge issue, right, for uh, all journalists, I think. And in most cases, <coughs> excuse me, um, and in the case that you're talking about, I think that was supposed to be a lighthearted video or, or something that was meant to be kind of fun and jocular and not very serious, I think. Um, I don't think it was about a literal brigade of ninja women who are uh, going to attack anybody. Um, 
in, in most cases, a serious allegation, which is what it is, we would not run without what we considered solid proof. Um, uh, obviously, something that that's uh, going to get, you know, th that's pot uh, potentially libel libelous. We would be careful about f for legal reasons, but more importantly and more basically, um, you know, we really believe that that we need to substantiate um, things that we report because they have consequences. They have consequences for the people you write about. If I if I report a rumor about someone and it turns out not to be true, well, I have I've damaged that person, uh, and over time, it, uh, it's important to, to Reuters, not only because of legal risks or anything like that, but because it damages us to be uh, publicly uh, irresponsible. So we try very hard not to, not to report things that we uh, are not confident are true. And sometimes that means using anonymous sources and Sometimes things are very legally sensitive, but um, you know we, we do take uh, lack of bias and independence and accuracy important. In, we do take them as important, consider them important. Take uh, and um, I know other big media that I'm aware of typically do that too. But um, you know sometimes we will report things. We've, we will usually not report. <coughs> You know, we stay away from rumors generally, um, uh, um, but we, we will report sensitive things if we um, strongly believe they are true. Um, we we published um, stories out of Iraq um, just a few days ago, where our reporters um, witnessed um, the you know essentially Lynch-style murders, and that was very dangerous. Um, but that was, they had that on camera. That was, the, the facts of the case were not in dispute. Um, but I don't, I don't have a good answer for you on when to report things you can't substantiate other than uh, if you can't substantiate it, you probably shouldn't be reporting it. Does that, does that address your question? Thanks. Yes, yes, please. Yes. <coughs> Jochen Legewi, CNC. Um, I have a question to the financial and business reporter, and it's about the competition that companies like Reuters or others, we don't name them here additionally, are That's with right. Nikkei. Ah. And uh, the fact that traditionally Japanese companies are very reluctant to be talking to the Reuters, etc., and more refer to, to Nikkei for transaction and other business financial related news. And Dan is now as a company who is probably the front runner in Japan, putting in a foreigner at head of global communications and probably the company who was the first starting for a more level playing field. Mm. And recently we have with Takeda and Toyota, mm. especially the latter one, mm. very remarkably similar tendencies. Uh, so do you see, and can you give us some comments on the facts is it more the companies that are moving into your direction? Or what does Reuters, Bloomberg, the others have to do to move more into the direction and become mm. more accessible, acceptable for the companies? Any comments mm. on this? Mm. Wow, that's, uh, that's a really interesting insight. Thank you. Um, yeah, who's moving more and who needs to move more? Um, uh, the, the, the simple answer is that everyone should talk to us first and they should leak to us <laughs> and not to the Nikkei. Uh, that's the simple answer. <clears throat> um, I, I, I do agree with you that, that some companies are moving to be more open. Some companies are daring to, to, to hire foreign um, media specialists, or at least paying more attention to the foreign audience. Um, uh, I suspect that's out of, um, I suspect that's a business decision that they feel they need to reach um, different media groups. 
Um, I was at a, uh, invited to a Kedanden meeting back in October that was, that was all, all of the people in the room were, uh, were PR officials from companies, big listed companies, most, well, yeah, Kedanden. Um, and, and they were very curious how to, how to get their story out to the foreign media, and they clearly thought it was important to do so. Uh, and um, Dan may have uh, opinions about this, but I think they just see it as in their interest. And uh, I don't think we've done anything differently. We've always been trying to get them to talk to us. Uh, and, you know, the, it is true that, that the Nikkei dominates the local business and financial landscape. And, you know, good for them. They're, uh, they're big and they're important. But it is, um, it can be sort of self-fulfilling. People leak to the Nikkei and Nikkei gets more business scoops and then people want to read the Nikkei and then that's who you leak to. And I do remember many years ago uh, being at a off-the-record briefing f with the head of one of the trading companies and he was speaking in flawless English uh, and he talked about some development that the company had made. I can't, I don't remember what it was. But he, the only thing I remember from that whole discussion was a completely um, uh, unintentional phrase that he said. And that was, he said uh, about this development, well, and then we released it, uh, we released it in the Nikkei. By which he meant, we gave the story to the Nikkei, uh, and it was published the next day. And to this senior executive, you know, international powerful guy, to him, that was disclosure. That, that counted like putting something on the, on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Uh, and both Bloomberg and the Financial Times, a few months back, uh, had stories about the power and influence of the Nikkei. Um, and uh, one insight, I believe, from the Bloomberg story was that um, uh, the, the leaks to the Nikkei are always far more accurate than uh, any analysts, any, any measure of what analysts say based on their, uh, their scrutiny of the company's books, because they're just leaking them the numbers. Uh, and I've, I've talked to reporters who, um, who say that the finance ministry, as just one example, loves to leak to the Nikkei because they can get their story out the way they want to get it out. One guy even said, and look, I drew this chart for them and they used it. Um, so, you know, uh, is, that the, is that full, fair, open disclosure? I don't know. Uh, but. Nikkei's got a good, uh, a, a good racket, and they're, and they're taking advantage of it, and I would too. Um, I, I, I have to say the TSE, the Tokyo Stock Exchange, has gotten a little bit more aggressive about, uh, about listed companies disclosing information to all the uh, shareholder, all market participants uh, in a, simultaneously. Um, they've gotten a little bit more aggressive about that, but... Um, it's completely off the topic of your question in the end, but uh, I, I, I think companies look to foreign media mainly for their own business reasons, and I, I hope that continues. Okay, thank you. Good question. Yes, yes please go ahead. You want to just stand up? Right. Yeah. Um, my name is Miyoshi, and I'm working for Ajinomoto PR department. Um, uh, since the pigeon is no more the powerful weapons, so the, it's very much different, uh, difficult to be advanced uh, in terms of the information to the others nowadays. Mm. And the, I had an opportunity recently, um, one journalist, the Japanese one, uh, the, the writer has to be the creator. Mm. Otherwise, mm. The, we cannot, we cannot mm. keep our, our, our value for a long time because for the speed, it's next to impossible to be the number one, I um, mean, the information holder or mm -hmm. the, uh, the value keeper. How do you think about this thing? Um, 
So you said the, the writer has to be the creator? Yeah, because one, one, one of the ways to keep the value of the writer uh -huh. is to be a creator. I see. Uh, um, uh, just, is the idea that um, if... if uh, so to dig the information yes. deeper and deeper. Yes, as opposed to taking something that, uh, that, the, that a, a company, for example, wants to disseminate and, and reporting it directly as you've got it? You mean uh, maybe for digging as opposed to... For the readers of the information, I guess. Yeah. Not just the quick information, mm. but the background of the information, I or see. the meanings of the information, or mm. what will be bring, uh, mm. brought, brought from the information. Right, right. Well, yes, um, that is a, a big important change. Uh, in, you know, in the old days, uh, many media, especially news wires, really saw themselves as just purveyors of facts, uh, you know, putting out press releases much like the PR business wire is now. Um, I can remember uh, seeing uh, Dow Jones wire when I worked at a, um, a newspaper in the late 1980s, and um, they were essentially transmitting press releases, uh, and that was, they saw themselves, their primary job as being a conduit of information, um, connecting what the company or the government wants to say, and, you know, the, the customers in the financial <coughs> markets, <clears throat> with no particular change, just, just giving them, just relaying the information. As you say, that, that has um, completely changed, because companies can uh, put things on their websites and tweet them and publish them, and there's uh, there is no. Uh, it's easy for people to get. Um, you know, just as I was saying that our news loses its value quickly, uh, and we're happy to give it away very soon. Um, you know, there there is no there's no money to be made anymore in just being the carrier pigeon that takes fact A to fact to uh, fact you know from place A to place B. And so, yes, uh, therefore, the, you know, what becomes important is, uh, you know, the reason that people would come to us and want to read us is one of two things. Um, we are first and or exclusive with a piece of information, mainly, or we're giving somebody um, value in terms of understanding the world. Some people call this scoops of fact and scoops of insight. And in that sense, the, the you know the, the, the digging and the writing and the context that um, journalists can provide does add value. Um, uh, the, the, the basic facts may be may have become commodities, but explaining what they mean uh, is uh, remains extremely valuable especially when we have so much information that we can't possibly uh, keep up with all of it. Um, sometimes a news site like Vox.com can do a great example of just collating, curating, and explaining um, uh, a story that's happening um, from a mass of data uh, and just telling you, here's what you need to know. And maybe their sources of information are the same that anybody else has, but they do take the time to analyze and synthesize and put context around a story. So we feel it's very important for us when we're writing to do the same thing with with our stories. It's um, certainly when um, you know if the Bank of Japan governor makes a comment about monetary policy and the yen, we're going to we're going to get that fact out there as fast as we can. Um, if we can dig up a fact about what a what a company uh, a company plans to buy another company or open a factory or shut down a a, a business line, we're going to get that fact out there uh, as you know as clearly as possible and as fast as possible. And that fact has value when it's fresh, and then very soon it doesn't have any value anymore. But then we have to put some meaning around that, some context, um, uh, some analysis. 
uh, and, and put it in a shape that makes sense. And then if we can do that, we're also adding value. Um, and and um, uh, at Reuters, we've also, something that, that didn't exist at the Reuters I left in, the, uh, in 2000, uh, but that is now important to us, is uh, writing much more deeply reported um, uh, investigative or enterprise stories. Um, we call them special reports. Um, uh, in, in Japan, for example, we've written, uh, put a lot of reporting into uh, writing stories about the conditions of the workers at the Fukushima, um, the destroyed plant there. That's, if I tell you that there's, there's some, that workers at Fukushima have, um, are in, you know, some very, uh, they have very difficult working conditions and they're not paid very much and they're um, subcontractors and sub sub subcontractors um, don't always treat them properly uh, and there's questions about the radiation that they're exposed to you might say okay so what but in those cases with uh, very long form stories that that look like a magazine investigative type piece, very long uh, and in-depth, we would provide a wealth of facts, interviews, documents um, that would try to make the story, uh, really bring the story to life so that the simple facts I just said um, might be the core of it, but you really get some understanding because um, we do find that people need um, people have a, um, uh, a need for and an interest in um, getting facts quickly, but also at, at the end of the day in really understanding, uh, you know, the world that, that we're in much more deeply. So I think there is, uh, in, the great, in the great ocean of knowledge, there's a big ch chunk of it. Uh, I guess you don't have chunks of oceans, but um, there's a lot of information now, and in, in what used to have, you know, used to be uh, a, uh, where where we spent a lot of our time as journalists writing this big middle section of the uh, of of, uh, of fact and information, and since the value of that has decreased and the supply has increased, in, you know, increasingly we're trying to go to one end or the other with um, you know, the, where the value is in either being exclusive or fast, um, and the other end is, is uh, adding um, context and knowledge and understanding, because everything in the middle is, is becoming less valuable. I hope that was responsive. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, David, go ahead. You wanted to... David Satterwhite? Go ahead. I'll try to be briefer. <laughs> David Satterwhite, an associate member and uh, formerly with the Economist Group and Fulbright. Um, your last comments were perfect in, re in regard to the question I was about to ask. In this very room, uh, Michael Woodford gave a riveting talk and uh, his book is, is, it also reads very, very well, the one mm -hmm. called Exposure. Mm -hmm. And I raise that in two contexts. Mm -hmm. One is the the issue that you just raised of investigative reporting. Mm. And that used to be so highly valued, mm. whether it's the Boston Globe or other notable papers that used to do that a lot and mm. put a lot of energy into that. Mm. I'm pleased to hear the spectrum that you described, although I'm, I'm sort of troubled by the middle mm. and gone. It's either the longer piece that's very investigative or contextual mm. or the spot moment. Mm. Um, so my question was formulated before your <laughs> comment. Uh, I just would wonder how much of that is going on. But uh. the second part about Michael Woodford's is, of course, to save his life in a sense, and I'm dr dramatizing because he's very dramatic about it. He had to get the story out, mm. and he selected who he was giving it all to, mm. and then everyone wanted to talk to him. Mm. Mm. In this very room or this very club, um, uh, questions to prime ministers might have brought them down uh, mm. in the sense of 
the role of the press in asking the tough questions. Mm. And so um, the juxtaposition between not wanting to harm your sources, mm. uh, not wanting to be beaten down like the nail, or um, being very cautious, of course, to get your story right, mm. uh, versus really probing. And so my question sort of brings in Michael Woodford and, and investigative reporting and doing the press's job of being that, uh, what do we, we have a phrase for it? Uh, not the fifth column, not, that's the wrong word. Fourth estate. Thank you, the fourth estate. That's what I meant to say, and forgive the other comment. Um, just your thoughts real quick, thank you. Yes, yes we do. That, so um, that's one of the reasons that I was happy to come back to Reuters is because we are doing that. And uh, the observation I would make on that is, while there have been all these big changes in media and, and some of it is you know, brutal in terms of competition, um, it's also the case that uh, a lot of people, I, I, I am kind of optimistic about investigative journalism. Um, I don't know if there's any way to measure that there's more of it or less of it, but I think the barriers to entry are lower more people can do it if they have a mind to, and Reuters has changed its culture to, to, to embrace that, and I think that's great, and that was, again, one of the reasons I was uh, pleased to, to rejoin the company. Um, and um, what was the, um, what's the name of the Los Angeles, the Torrance County, um, tiny little paper that just won a Pulitzer for local news reporting, the Daily Breeze or something? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Little six-person newsroom um, uh, that, that, that did exactly what you said. It, it was um, investigations that began with just beat reporting uh, on the education beat. Um, basically three people driving a story. They didn't even realize it was a a, a package of stories they were just reporting but then they really stuck with it so you know the uh, and the you know the the, the internet the the, uh, the the ease of access has made you know I think made it open to to anybody um, to to do investigative reporting so I think that that remains vibrant at the same time there's a lot of <laughs> what passes for journalism now that seems to be people just riffing off things that are out there. You know, you see byline stories on websites summarizing what Jon Stewart just said. Like, okay, um, thanks for saving me the trouble of watching the video. I don't quite get the value proposition there, but they're doing it, so fine, good for them. Um, and I do say that the middle has sort of hollowed out. Um, I guess what I mean is that's where uh, everybody, it's not just us, uh, is putting more emphasis on the, the two nodes, if you will. Uh, we still write plenty of stories every day of, you know, here's what the finance minister said or here's what uh, the company announced. But, you know, we, we, we're looking for uh, value at, at other ends of the spectrum. Um, uh, in terms of the, the Woodford case, that was, um, I believe that was Jonathan Sobel sitting at this table? Yeah, he used to work for me, and I taught him everything he knows. Um, he used to work at Reuters. Uh, used to work at Dow Jones. Used to work at the FT. Now he's at yeah. the New York Times. Um, uh, and and yeah, he had a, a great scoop with that one. I'm not I'm not sure if that was the same kind of deep, uh, dogged, time-consuming uh, investigation, but it doesn't matter. It was a, it was you know it was a it was a great story, and it was an important story. And you know I'd like. I'd like to see more executives spilling the beans on what's going on in their companies. Uh, I'd like them to be telling it to me rather than Jonathan, but, you know, whatever. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ambassador, please go ahead. Um, we're after 8 o'clock. I can smell the, the fumes yeah. from, <laughs> from the dinner, so we'll wrap it up quickly. Please go My ahead. My name yeah. is Khalil Hassan. I'm Ambassador of Bahrain. I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Money media shaping mind. Hmm. How this relationship would evolve in the next 50 years. Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. I thought we were having easy questions tonight. Um, 
money, media, shaping the mind, how will this involve, evolve in the next 50 years? Um, goodness gracious, uh, I don't know how they're going to involve in the next, evolve in the next five years. Uh, we're certainly seeing a big convergence of things that we call media and things that never were media. Um, you know, the old, the old town crier now can be heard by a billion people, more than that. Um, gosh, you've stumped me. Um, I would, I would, wise, yeah, I would say that um, the, the the relationship between money and media has changed drastically. Even when a young fellow such as myself joined, uh, you know, newspapers uh, back in the late '80s, those were cash cows back then because the barriers to entry in media were very high. Um, they used to you know, uh, talk about don't, uh, uh, don't go up against somebody who buys his ink by the barrel uh, because that person you know, had access to uh, you know, getting information out to people and that was power and that was money because there was not other competition and they needed advertisers. Well, that's gone. Um, you know, newspapers, as everybody knows, uh, in, in the United States, anyway, are in, you know, uh, is free fall too strong a word? They're in, they're in very serious Trouble. Uh, <laughs> challenges. Uh, and and uh, anybody can ha have a, a platform and be heard anywhere now. Um, you know, I, it's often said, and I believe that, that this may be uh, a terrible time uh, for journalists, but it's a great time for journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's great that, that information can come out and there's going to be a lot of irresponsible information coming out, but that's what happens and people, I hope, I think, will gravitate to what's uh, useful and accurate and, and, and compelling and interesting. Um, so I can only imagine that that trend will continue. Um, I don't know what the landscape will look like. I don't know what the next big thing in, in media will be, um, shaping minds, uh, gosh, I don't know, uh, you know, what this, at, uh, I, I, in some ways I think that um, uh, information, the transmission of information has dumbed down a lot. Um, uh, my, my, my daughter's um, First, the younger one first, she shocked me by saying she doesn't do email anymore uh, because it's too slow. Uh, uh, and they do the, the Snapchat thing. Is that the one that disappears in six seconds? Uh, there's no, there's also no don't understand yet. that at all. Um, but shorter and shorter. Now she's got a new app that, that um, where you, you, you pass along GIFs, G-I-Fs, mm -hmm. however you pronounce that that are about three seconds long. Mm -hmm. So I mean this, and then they, it, and they just loop around and around. And so, you know, I'm, I'm worried for attention spans. Um, uh, you know, but then again, you can say a lot in a haiku. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know where all this is going. And yet, and yet, as all of this is happening, there is an appetite um, for the deep story, the deep dive, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, and, and they're on, various kind of platforms and, and you know I find myself reading long stories on a on a screen that big and I would have never thought that so I think I think um, you know some of those trends confuse me and scare me in terms of the dumbing down and the shrinking but there's uh, you know my kids write much more than I ever did I never wrote if I didn't have to when I was growing up and I didn't write a letter unless you know, my mother said she would take the, the present away from me if I didn't send the thank you letter. And kids are writing constantly. Um, it may be, it, it may look trivial to us, but they're writing and, you know, people are communicating by the written word, which it's just great. And people are communicating by pictures and videos in a way that they never could before. So that's, that's great. And so I, I can only guess that there's going to be more uh, democratization of uh, of media, and I hope that's a good thing. Right. Excellent. Okay, Billy, really, thank you so much. Thank really, you. Really appreciate this. Thank you.
Okay, um, just quickly before we break up and, and enjoy some snacks and drinks, uh, I just wanted to give you the, the, the schedule really quickly. Uh, next month, uh, Martin Fackler uh, will be coming, um, the bureau chief from the New York Times. In June, we'll have Brian Fowler. Is he here this evening? Is no, Brian he's not. Here? No, okay. He was going to come heckle me, but he changed. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, bureau chief from Bloomberg. Um, in July, we'll have Ken Moritsugu, uh, the bureau chief for AP. Uh, there will be no seminar in August. September, there will be uh, J Jake Schlesinger, Bureau Chief of the Wall Street Journal. October will be Robin Harding uh, with the Financial Times. And in November will be Richard Lloyd Perry, who's the Asia correspondent uh, for the, the Times, uh, based in London. So uh, please come every month. We're looking forward to seeing you. So please um, enjoy and ask Billy many, many questions. <laughs> brought some meishi, I don't know if I got enough okay. for the whole group. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.